Gold Standard Rugby Podcast with Lawrence Delalio. Hello and welcome to this week's podcast. After a very entertaining opening weekend of the Six Nations, we'll be chatting about the highlights from those games as well as looking ahead to what's to come in round two. And with me in the studio is the Evening Standard, Steve Cording. Hi, Steve. How are you? Very well indeed. Good Fresh good. back from Rome. Mm. Uh, and after a great comeback from Wales at the Principality Stadium on Saturday, which nearly resulted in them claiming victory, it only seemed right and fitting to get a Welsh rugby legend on the podcast. It's Jonathan Davis. Jiffy, how are you? Cheers, lad. Yeah. Not 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 uh, not the you know, the greatness comeback because we didn't win, but uh, it was certainly <laughs> exciting. Well, listen. Before we talk about that match, um, unfortunately, we have to start with the sad news of passing of Barry John over the weekend. Um, I mean, was that something that was expected in in Wales, or it sort of came out of the blue? Really, and it's very sad. I th- yeah, I think it's come out of the blue. I don't know, and really knew Barry. You know, was ill or whatever. So um, yeah, I was driving into. Uh, record Scrum 5 last night and um, it just uh, broke that he'd sadly passed away so um, and as you can imagine with the accolades that JPR had uh, in the previous week um, mm. you know, it was exactly the same um, they were, you know the nation loved him I think he was such a great player and, and he had style and grace about him and poise and um, you know he, the, the way he, he played the game he just enjoyed it didn't worry about anything um, and of course, seventy-one uh, Grand Slam with Wales, and then you know that amazing seventy-one tour with the with the Lions. So um, you know, people regard him as maybe the greatest. So you know, he's and if you get the New Zealand press, which you know what they like, Lord, yeah. um, if they're um, if if they're kind of you know christening him the king, yeah. well, it's, <laughs> it says it all. It says it all. Really, it says it all. Well, listen up. Very sad news, and our thoughts go out to, yeah. to all his close family and friends, and and to everyone in Wales, because uh, you know anyone who was um, you know lucky enough to watch him play, because he, he's a, a true legend. Jiffy, moving on, I think we may as well start that game in Cardiff on Saturday afternoon. I was in Rome for the England game, um, and obviously uh, we'll get your thoughts on uh, on everything Ireland and, and France. But... I, I was fortunate enough to be listening to Jiffy on on the BBC, and and, and it felt like a roller coaster uh, listening to you Jif, commentating. Jif, do you know what? I I get it, got to give it to you. You know, I commentate, and whenever I I thought the last ten minutes or so, you were, you were coaching the team, my friend, <laughs> uh, and your your passion uh, for trying to, trying to get them over the line was uh, was fantastic. Yeah. Really, you know, but... you know what it's like, Lolly. You know, it's you know you we've been doing it a long time, the, the both of us now, and. Uh, it, you're supposed to try and stay impartial, but you know, everyone knows, you know, where you're from, who you support, and it's very difficult when the emotion gets gets involved. Mm. And um, it was just one of those games where <clears throat> we were so poor in the first half. You yep. know, even Gatlin said worst performance in his coaching career, which says a lot. So, um, but I just felt that they didn't know their identity. I, I saw oh. them before the game mm. on the in the anthem, and they were all very young and they were all nervous. And as if they they had the shackles on in the first half and they couldn't cope physically mm. with the Scottish boys. And in the second half, they had to throw it about. And I don't think there was a game plan. Because I went to see Rob Holy in the week and he said, well, we want to loosen it up a bit. We want to play, keep the ball in play. But they were losing the aerial battle. They were kicking far too early so they weren't putting pressure on the Scottish back three and they just diffused any high kicks, you know. So they were, re- and Finn Russell had a, an amazing first half yeah, because he had the easiest ride in the world. In the second half, he started to chuck a ball about, play a little bit wider. Johan Lloyd came on and we started asking questions of them. And I, I think when I was really surprised with Scott, because I thought Scotland might have hardened up a little bit yep. uh, in the World Cup with the group they were in. But I still felt there was a little bit of a soft underbelly in the second half and they couldn't respond and step up. And um, so, um, yeah, it was, in, and in a way where, where they got to, they should have won because, yeah. you know, momentum in sport is massive. Scotland had it all their own way in the first half, scored 27 points. Wales had it all in the second half, apart from the last 10 minutes. And so what happened? They missed one crucial line up when they were on a roll, got into a position, they only had a drop goal or kick a penalty. But then again, they, they they got it back, and then they had a forward pass as well. Yeah, so mm-hmm. looking at it, looking at it, if they were a little bit more experienced, you know, they might have got yeah. the way with one of the greatest comebacks of all do, time. Do, and do, I don't know do, why yeah. they would have left Scotland. Do you think that with um, 
with Dafith uh, Jenkins, who's who's the second youngest Wales captain in yeah. history, um, behind Gareth Edwards. I mean, obviously, they've got a young team. Uh, a lot of experience has, has walked out the door. Do you think the Welsh public have just got to be quite patient this season because it is a rebuild? Yeah. It is a rebuild, um, and you know they've they've shown glimpses of what they're capable of, but it, it's just not going to happen overnight, is it? No, we are where we are. Alan. That's the difference, you know. I think you look at the the regions, you know, they're kind of not not getting great results in the URC. A lot of uh, players have retired. A lot of players have, you know, have, have taken you know the money abroad. So. We are where we are, and Welsh rugby is where it is. And I think that, you know, that's what um, uh, Gatlin's done. Warren's gone right. He's there for the future. We need to build a side around this kid. Yeah. And that's, if you look at, you know, they're, they're all very young. They're all, you know, maybe pushed into it a little bit earlier than, than expected. And that's where we are. And you're right. We have to be patient. You know, it'll be interesting to see in Twickenham how they cope because, we can't out muscle teams anymore. So the Warren ball is gone. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, we haven't got the Jamie Roberts, Shanklin, Johnny Fox Davis, and the ball carriers that we had. So now we have to kind of look at and try and find a new identity for this for this young side. Well, looking ahead to uh, Saturday, you might actually like this, Jiffy, because uh, we are working with uh, QBE Business Insurance. So they've created their own predictor, which uh, simulates the tournament <laughs> 10,000 times, producing the outcome from 150,000 games. And every match is replicated by generating a number of tries, conversions, penalty scored by each team. Uh, it's actually done by their actuaries at QBE. And the score that they are predicting for Saturday is, Lowell, you might want to put your hands over your ears now, England 22, Wales 24. So is that a possibility? Yeah. Do you think that could happen? I mean, England, obviously, in rebuilding phase as well. Um, they played well on Saturday. I think we'll I agree think, with that, but there's a lot to improve on. Yeah. I think we take, you know, I take, we take any positives at the moment uh, to just uh, <laughs> give them a bit of co- to give them a bit of confidence. That's what I think. So, uh, but it's I, I'm not a I'm not a huge stats man to be honest. The only stat that really bothers me is the scorer, <laughs> and um, you know yeah. we've been doing this for so long. It's you know people who kick. Most internationals usually win. But I think that for me now, it's it's not the possession you have, it's what you do with it. And that's 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 key for me. You know, when you have possession, when you have momentum, you have to get the, the scoreboard ticking over. So it, it's gonna be it's gonna be really interesting because I think England in, in Twickenham, the, the, all the pressure's on them. Yeah. And they're expected to win. Um and it'll be and it'll see how we and if if we just co- cope with it with a you know, the forward power um, and the front the front row, and we get our basics right, then we have parity in the set piece. Then with Tommy Raphael and, and Wayne Wright, I think there'll be opportunities there. But it'll be very, very yeah. interesting. I think this now for Warren and the team is right. What, what, how are we going to play? Mm-hmm. Because although we lost to Scotland, it was a huge game. We played well in the second half. It doesn't get any easier for us because we are England away, Ireland away, France home, and then Italy. <laughs> so if you look at it, realistically, that maybe those three games, you know, we, we'll be going in as clear underdogs and we might not get a result. And then all of a sudden the pressure yeah. is, is to avoid the wooden spoon. So, you know, it's, that's why the tournament is the best tournament, annual tournament in the world. It just keeps on giving with, mm-hmm. with surprises and performances and brings up superstars. So, Jiffy, we can't let you go without yeah. uh, talking about Ireland. Uh, Friday night, uh, I watched it in a pub surrounded by Irishmen. Um, I mean, I think, we were all blown away by that performance. I don't, I don't think anybody saw that French hangover lasting as long as it did. Um, Andy Farrell knows what he's doing, doesn't he? I, I you know, I, I, I've known Faz a long time. You know, he's a seventeen-year-old, and he played prop against New Zealand in a Test match up in Headingley. So he mm. knows the ins and outs of of both games now, and he's adapted well to Union. Mm. And I still, th- I still think that if, when they go to Australia, I think they'll go three 0 right? I think they'll yeah. beat Australia three 0 with the Lions. That's an early prediction. But I, um, I think that the good that when you watch all the island um, provinces play, and you watch the under twenties play, they know of a system where they all all know what they're doing. And when you see someone like Jack Crowley just stepping in, you know, they didn't really miss Johnny Sexton. He was so you know dominant. Very his communication was good, and I think you know he takes the ball to the line. He double pumps like rugby league. Mm. And there's a lot of rugby league elements to their attack inside, you know, and, and their structure. So the biggest compliment I can give 
Ireland at the moment. I still think they're the best team in the world. They had a blip against New Zealand, you know, one defensive lapse and they lost. Uh, but for me, we always say New Zealand the best side in the world because of their rugby intelligence. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Their decision making throughout. And I think that's where Ireland now are very good. Yeah. I just think that everyone knows what they're doing. They make the right decisions. They're clinical. Their execution is good. Their ball skills are good. And that, that's why they are where they are. And they are on a different level to anyone else now, you know, and um, it'll be a surprise if they don't win the Grand Slam now for me. Yeah, I think people yeah. forgot the fact that, yeah, yes, they lost to New Zealand, probably because they didn't kick a couple of first-half penalties, if I'm honest. They got a bit gung-ho in the World Cup, yeah. but before that, they were 18 games yeah. unbeaten, Yeah, um, you know, home and away, yeah. including a test series in New Zealand. Mm. And I think they probably were a bit peed off that they were, um, written off going into this game in Marseille. Yeah. Everyone said the French will just, you know, think yeah. they're legit, etc. And their forward pack, the Ireland forward pack, I thought was outstanding. You know, they took the game to, and they blew the French away right in the, in the open. They almost started how the home team should have started mm. the game and, 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 and almost made the Johnny Sexton conversation go away completely. So, yeah, yeah. so we have a look at the weekend games then. Who, who are you going to, who are we going to go for then? Let's have a look. What's the sort of predictor? Let's have a look at well, our, listen, our, our, our insurance friends at QBE who normally get things pretty right because they, they, have, to, they have to set the price of people's insurance. Well, they, 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 they? they picked Ireland to win uh, last week, but only by a point. So I don't think anybody saw that, that sort of scoreline. And they picked Scotland to win, didn't no. they? They did, yeah, and England. So I guess it was a it was a clean sweep. So we've already said that they're going for Wales. Um, yeah. Scotland are hosting France. Yeah. Uh, the QBE predictor is saying that will be a France win 24 to 21. And then obviously I think uh, we all know what the result they're going to forecast on Sunday, which yeah. is... Ireland at home to Italy, and that's going for 38-17. Do you see, can you see the Scots beating the French? I still, I think they are capable of beating them. Yeah. Definitely capable of beating them, but I think there'll be a reaction from France. Yeah. I'm going France, Ireland. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then the big one. And I, on. I still think that, Draw. Yeah, I still think that um, England, in, England, I'm not going to bottle it. <laughs> Um, I think <laughs> England to win that Twickenham, I'm afraid. I think that they've just got too much for for Wales, and it'll be interesting to see how England play. Yep. Because they haven't got their identity yet as well. And they'll, and if hopefully, mm. hopefully they'll play an open, expansive game like the crowd want, and they engage in a in a free for all. It'd be an amazing game, a nice open world game, and just suit everyone. Well, listen, Jiffy. That, uh, listen, regardless of that, I hope I hope you're right. You're coming up. Um, I'm going to see you at Twickenham on Saturday. You've managed to get enough tickets for, Ooh, your, for your son. Dangerous. You managed to get enough tickets for your son and all his mates to come up as well now. So I, I tell you, I tell you, I, I, I've had tickets for my mates, you know, my, my boy and his mates. So he's up there as well. But I'm try, trying to get tickets for Rob Brydon, right? Yeah. And I was like struggling, yeah. and yeah. then uh, fair play, Trimsar and RFC. My junior club came oh, through yes. with tickets for Rob Brady. Well, yeah, and you're speaking so at their I'm, dinner um, for the next four years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, he's, I know. Or Rob loved to do something because I did, I did Rob a favour. I went to speak in his um, mother's women's institute in right. Port Albert years ago. It was like, it, was, it wasn't the blue sea of um, Port Albert, it was the blue rinse of Port Albert. Right? So, <laughs> yeah. you know, it was, hey, everybody wants to be in Chicken yeah. It's a great, a great place to be, right? And, yeah. Wales, Wales, England is a great event. So. Can't wait to see you, mate. See you on Saturday. Cheers, Jiffy. Cheers, boys. Take care, lads. All the best, Steve. Take care. Joining us now is the Evening Standards rugby correspondent, Nick Puruel. Nick, um, did you enjoy your time in Rome? I saw you very briefly um, as I uh, managed to get away after the match and, and get back on Saturday. But uh, glorious day in Rome and I guess eventually um, a decent result for England. Yeah. It, it was. I mean, it's a great time. It's, a, it's an incredible city, an incredible place, and it's so, it's so great that it's um, it's on the on the map um, and calendar for for especially for England fans because you could see there were thousands and thousands, and and um, quite obviously this is the weekend they've tar- the England fans have targeted where they take their wives and girlfriends, and it's a uh, you know it's a great thing to see because it is a you know very uh, enjoyable um, you know weekend. For all concerned, I think one issue was um, obviously England, a bit of a messy performance, but at least they got the result. Yeah, they got a new new captain, um, five new players, two two debutants starting, and and, and a few off the bench. So I, I suppose there there is a little bit of um, mitigation in in their performance, but uh, 
Uh, I mean, I, at the end of the game, as a, as a half Italian, half Englishman, I didn't know whether to feel proud about Italy's performance, the closest they've ever come to beating England by three points, and and the most points that they've ever scored against England in a game, uh, or whether I felt a little bit sort of underwhelmed yeah. by by England, and and probably I felt a little bit of both, half and half. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. It's a bit like when 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 England play India at cricket. For me, you, you feel like you can't really lose. So it's just kind of. I get your point. I get your point, Lawrence. Entirely. I think it's. Um, I think England are obviously, you know, in another state of flux. And something I've written for for the paper is just basically saying it's about time they've got to get out of this constant cycle of change. You know, the turnover of coaches under Eddie Jones was ridiculous. It's different because Steve Borthwick is trying to bring in stability. But there are going to be further changes in the summer. You've got things like Andrew Strawbridge here for a month. Um, you know, Phoenix Jones taking over defence. Kevin Sinfield leaving in the summer. He will be replaced by a coach, but not a like-for-like -like coach. And there's obviously a big chance that they could bring in an experienced hand to look at the attack and probably help Richard Ricklesworth develop, which is probably what would be the smart thing to do. But every time they make a change in personnel in the coaching box, in comes a new system. It seems crazy that England have never actually had a full-on blitz slash rush defence before, but they've got one now, and they're saying that's taking time to bed in. But actually, the whole point of a blitz system is it's not supposed to be very difficult. The key thing is everybody just, you just, everyone flies up together, but they made mistakes. They made some basic mistakes, and yes, it's game one, so that's fine, but they have to improve markedly. Otherwise, better teams will turn them over. Yeah, I think, I think listen, in, in England's defence, Having been there before myself, there, there's five new players. Mm. There is a new coach in Felix Jones. They are trying to attack differently. It's going to take time because you need yeah. to spend time on your attacking game. And, you know, they are evolving away from, um, you know, whatever you want to call it, the, the style of rugby that, that, uh, that they played in the World Cup. Um, and I thought in attack, they, they didn't quite have the shape that they want. And defensively, Felix Jones... The coach, um, you know, you're, you're going to have system errors. You're going to have uh, a few little problems. You're right. They have to put those right. Good, good players, you know, don't make the same mistake twice. So um, I think, you know, we can we can take that. I think there were positives. Tommy Freeman's performance, Ethan Root's performance, mm -hmm. um, the fact that they've got five new players that are now capped. Um, and the fixture list allows them, with Wales coming up to Twickenham, to sort of build their intensity as they go through the tournament. I mean... It's just nice to see England win the first game of the tournament yes. for a while. I'm, I'm glass half, glass half full. I mean, I said Definitely. if England if England win more games than they lose, <laughs> then I think um, they'll, they'll do all right. I was always a player. I hope that people got honesty from after the game. Um, I'd, I did, I missed all the the, the post match reaction, but uh, I mean, England will be happy enough that they won. But it was a scrappy second half with the whistle blowing a lot. What was Jamie George's assessment? to you Nick because Jamie's um, tactically very astute he's always very honest and I think as long as the England players yeah. realise that that wasn't really a great performance um, you know it, and it can be a lot better and it will have to be a lot better do you think we got that level of honesty that we haven't necessarily had in the past? I think we did actually and I think that is I think Jamie George's influence is, is going to rub off on Steve Borthwick and hopefully that's already happened because both of them were fairly candid about where they were I mean one thing Steve said was if he if if the full time score had been twenty seven seventeen, perhaps you think that's more reasonable. <clears throat> but um, you know they did leak that late try, and they can't get away from that. And I, th I think they were both saying, "Good to get the win. Important to get the win. Um, lots of mistakes. Quite messy. Quite a lot of things need to tidy up." But they're confident that's what they'll be able to do. And uh, just that basically, as they move forward, um, you know, what they're bringing in a new culture of of not. Um, sort of condemning each other and individuals for, for mistakes. And um, so they're trying to remove a fear of failure, um, which Steve Borthwick has said a number of times, he felt like that was present in England squads when he was a player. And he thinks it's been like, he's been that way in England for a long time and he, he wants to change that. And I think that's a good thing. Well, Nick, um, I'll obviously be seeing you at Twickenham on Saturday along with Steve and we'll uh, look forward to that. In fact, that's all we've got time for in this episode. So my thanks to Nick and to Steve and, of course, to our very special guest, Jonathan Davis, a.k.a. Jiffy. Um, thanks as well. Go to VoxPod Studios for hosting us. We'll be back next week with all things Six Nations. So enjoy round two. And until then, thanks for listening and see you soon. <laughs>